many more delegates arriving than had registered. And uh, so we will probably be having to bring in some additional um, chairs, so please we'll do that as quietly as possible. Uh, if you have got a chair on your table, just put up your hand so that somebody can come and sit there and we can proceed. Uh, as Carol Lincoln said, we've clearly got to be very popular. So <laughs> this is wonderful. So it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to our first in-person conference since June 2019. It is wonderful to recognize so many of you again and to see so many new faces too. I'd like to give a special welcome to our funding partner. We are particularly privileged to have the president of the Kresge Foundation, uh, Rip Rapson, join us. Rip, without the support from Kresge Foundation, this would not have been possible. So, and all that we will report on in the course of this, uh, of this conference would not have been possible. And to you, Bill, our program officer, over my long career, I have engaged with well over 50 funding partners and have never engaged with someone so passionate about the work, so connected in it, so full of ideas, so encouraging, but never insistent. Thank you. And Ashley, um, Johan Johnson, I don't see where you are, but uh, it's good to be able to meet you. You'll all enjoy meeting Ashley as well as a new program officer at the Kresge Foundation. Also, a special welcome to one of our keynote speakers, Tim Fowler from the Tertiary Education Commission in New Zealand. New Zealand has also embarked on a student success journey, so it will be fascinating to hear more about their approach. To Carol Lincoln, Vice President and stalwart at Achieving the Dream, it is wonderful you are finally here. <laughs> Without your knowledgeable, consistent and imaginative support, we would have achieved a fraction of what we have. It's also a special welcome to representatives of the Department of Higher Education and to the previous DDG and Chief Director. Our partnership could not have happened without the University Capacity Development Grant, which has often supported the good ideas that have come up through the Sia Formulela Initiative. Uh, it has been an essential component and I'm pleased to say, uh, as you will hear on Friday, the UCDG will be continuing to support student success work uh, and you will continue to be able to uh, draw on that grant in, 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 as long as you propose it for your membership fees and for various of your activities. We are also pleased to welcome um, members from NISFAS, National Student Financial Aid. Um, again, we will see from some of the slides um, how very much uh, NISFAS how big a player this fuss has become in South African higher education. So four years ago, when we were in this very hall, we decided to have a great change. Instead of facing that way, we faced it this way. Um, we were not a network. We were five partner universities working together. And at that meeting, we presented an ambitious vision for the future of the Sia Pumalela network. This vision had been collaboratively developed over several interactions with many players. And today we plan to report back to you on what we have achieved and to clarify what still needs to be done. The Siapur Malela model has borrowed about from the concept of collective impact. Multiple members working collaboratively towards a common agenda with shared ways of measuring impact supported by a backbone team. Here we will see Sia Pumalela's agenda. This first one, establishing evidence-based student, sorry, establish a more student-centered culture in South Africa's higher education system to improve student completion rates and reduce, ideally eliminate, equity differences to expand evidence-based student success efforts on a national scale using a networked approach that builds on existing strengths and shares capacity. And then finally, improves institutional capacity to collect and use student data to improve student success across the higher education system. 
And I think we have made great progress in reaching in, in all of these purposes, but we still have a long way to go, perhaps particularly in the last. Um, rather than the community and the collective impact, in, they have a, a, a requirement of, a, um, of mutually reinforcing activities. We have emphasized the great importance of learning from each other. And I think almost every institution here can talk about how they have learned from another institution and put in place some of what that other institution has done. So this, <coughs> these are the components of the Siapo Malayla network. And you will see this uh, picture uh, many times in the course um, of this conference because we are trying to unpack the different components um, of the network. I'm going to start um, with the first one, and that is of the network members. You see number one down at the bottom. Their partners, their associates, and their participant members. You might wonder what the differences are. Um, well, in terms of the work, I'm not sure there are huge differences. It's just in terms of some funding. Um, the partner institutions have been given a grant from um, the Kresge Foundation. The associate was a previous partner who'd been given a grant, that's University of Pretoria, and have continued uh, to be involved. I think we have 18 members of the University of Pretoria uh, at this particular conference. And then participant members who belong to the network um, and have been given services um, by the network uh, and are in fact in most cases using the university development grants in order to carry the work, the work forward. During the conference, there will be presentations from each of the partners identifying the highlights of what they have achieved. There will be four today, starting at, I had said 9.45, it will be a little later, and three tomorrow from 10.15. I hope that we will be up to date by that time. There are inspiring titles like Building for Soretti, Evidence, Impact and Care, another one, Connecting Students for a Brighter Future, data integration and building a student success network. And finally, knowing, doing, and transforming, um, which you will see a little later is something we've probably not made as much progress as we would like, but is certainly on the agenda. At a great workshop yesterday of all the participant institutions, we heard of their most impressive achievements in the two and a half years, or in some cases, the one and a half years that they have been members. They will not be presenting in plenary, but they are offering uh, papers in the parallel sessions, so be, be sure to hear what they have to say. Let me just tell you what these, me these members are, and I'll be very quick. These were the uh, seven partners, and these are the participant institutions. And the ones in red are the ones who have joined us most recently. So that is 17 members out of 26 universities in South Africa. Um, and we do have many knocking at the door. You might wonder, uh, if, well let me just say, and I think Witty, who I see in the audience here from the CAT now, we were criticised in this room some years ago about working mainly with, you know, very well functioning, possibly some elite institutions, or mainly in elite institutions. Um, but I just wanted to give you some idea from some work that Charles um, <coughs> Shepherd has been doing for us of the different kinds of, uh, of the profile of these networks. So here is an enrollment by quintiles for the partners. And you'll see quintile one to three are the schools, quintile four to five, and then some private and others. Now there's huge variation amongst these partners, um, but it is really important to see that over 50% of Nelson Mandela University, UKZN, and the University of the Free State of their first full-time, at least their first time entry undergraduate students are from quintiles one to three schools. I suspect this puts South Africa's higher education system as one of the most inclusive in the world. 
Another indication of this is the MISFAS sponsors, uh, those, those students who are sponsored in the partner institutions. And once again, we see some amazing figures here. UKZN, nearly 80% of their students are NISFAS um, sponsored. And to be NISFAS sponsored, your family must earn, the whole family must earn a really rather modest amount um, in order to qualify. And we can also see from this graph here that it's increasing. So from each year, from 2021, to 2020 and 2021, there has been an increase in that proportion. And one might want to start to wonder, well, how are these students doing? Because they too will come from very poor families um, and will not have had the advantages of many of the students that we have been used to having in our higher education system. Um, and just to give you one of the findings from uh, Charles's analysis. Um, this is a graph showing the difference in success rates between NISPA students and non-NISPA students. And what I think is quite remarkable here is how close they all are. One or two percent, and in one case, actually the NISPA students are doing better. Um, we didn't have DUT's figures uh, in, in this particular case. Uh, but I do think it's a testament to um, South Africa's commitment to equity that we are achieving these sorts of results. And now back to our, I told you you'd get tired of this diagram. We have completed number one and just spoken about uh, the partners uh, and the participant members and some idea of the diversity and the inclusivity of those partner members. And now we'll move to our coaches. Um, our coaches are a remarkable group and this is something that we are particularly proud of. In Siapumalela 1, we had a coach from Achieving the Dream. Towards the end, we started to develop a South African cadre of co coaches. There were six of them, you can see all six of them here. Uh, Delicia Tim unfortunately has had to um, pull out because of other commitments. Um, and these coaches have been developed and have developed themselves um, through working collaboratively but also from a great deal of support from Achieving the Dream. Jan Lydon, our initial coach, has continued to be involved. I don't think she would have joined us um, because it is, I don't know, 2 a.m. in the morning in, um, where she lives. Um, but she has been a great help to us and as has um, the colleague coaches, each of our coaches has a colleague coach as well um, from Achieving the Dream. So we pay tribute to this amazing cadre and we hope that we'll be able to develop it further as we have more institutions um, who would like the service of, of a coach. Yesterday it was really interesting to hear how in the, in, in the part, uh, participant members um, they all pay tribute to the co coaches and the role that they have played in helping to shape the that, that we have managed. These services have revolved around three things, supporting students, uh, use of data for student success, and finally, transforming institutions. Um, many of these workshop, of the workshops were clustered around these three uh, themes, Let fewer of them on transforming institutions, but we'll come to that later. But it's really important to note that these services are only possible because of the contribution of the partners. So, say the uh, uh, produced the, the Carnegie Second Study on Poverty, which really uh, indicted the effect of, uh, of apartheid on South Africa, and also hinted at ways in which the country could go forward to address that poverty. And Salju has been with us since the very beginning of this journey. And um, in fact, uh, way back when, before Sadie was even involved, I asked Murray, you know, is there anybody on your campus who might be able to go to a conference called Achieving the Dream in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina? And he suggested the person who is now the deputy of Salju, Vimal Ramshaw. Um, and he became one of the first three people, along with also the top singer Gude, who went to Achieving the Dream and started this uh, really wonderful process. 
It's for these reasons I'm delighted to introduce Murray. Uh, he is the UCT professor of economics, and he received his BA from Rhodes, his PhD from Notre Dame. In addition to running Sound Drew, Murray is the principal investigator of Sound Huckabee's National Household Panel Survey, the National Income Dynamics Study, NIDS. You may hear about that later. And one of the reasons we wanted him here is back in Chicago, we heard from um, we heard from uh, Raj Chetty, one of America's most noted economists, uh, who talked about income inequality and poverty and educational opportunity in the United States. So we wanted to say, you know, what are we, what, what is our story here in South Africa? So he's going to discuss catalyzing social mobility through student success and um, see if we have a little bit of time possibly to do some Q&A, but uh, I am delighted to welcome Murray Lightman to the day. is not really the right word for these sorts of convenings, is it? Uh, how many of you have been to Achieving the Dream? The bit, hands up, need a bit higher. Yeah, great. And, uh, uh, and how many of you have been to one of these Sia Pumalela conferences before? Conference is not a conference, right? And the reason it's not a conference is because it's a convening of all of us who are quite serious about what we do and making a difference. And that's exactly the time of achieving the dream. I've been myself, uh, and uh, it's quite inspirational. And uh, and so uh, the, the uh, rice chain of achieving the dream provided the context within which people do their work. Like what are the challenges you're facing in uh, with the students coming into your institutions, and uh, and what are the contributions that you make by doing a good job and supporting those students. And that's my task today, to do that. Um, and, it's, and I'm really trying to include, it's an inclusive discussion to, to give you some framing to, for, for the rest of our work at this, at this meeting. And it's also inclusive in terms of, uh, I'm talking to the work of C.F. Pambili, which you would have seen on Jenny's slides uh, earlier, uh, as the soldier connection into Sia Pumalela. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful partnership for us. <clears throat> and so you can see that really uh, I'm, I would have violated the uh, Popular Act, the Protection of Personal Information Act, because most of the work for this presentation was done by Nicola Branson and Emma Whitelaw, who are over there in the corner. They got quite far away because I was threatening to pull them up uh, <laughs> if needed. Um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, and so it's just to give give them credit, and it's a privilege to talk to to the work that we've been doing, uh, and splice it in with the work that you do. Um, so we're going to start. Uh, we, we're going to try and mimic, in some sense, as many of the things that Bryce Chetty did in the in the U.S. context. Uh, we'll start with some framing of our inequality issues in our country, uh, and in particular. The, the what do we know about mobility in our country, the social mobility, because how are you going to, we all know South Africa has very high inequality, don't we? Um, uh, but, the, and the way to overcome that uh, is through social mobility. There's no other way of transforming the texture of society. Um, and it turns out that, that post-secondary schooling is, plays a crucial role, as in the Chetty presentation. It plays an absolutely central role. Uh, and so uh, you and all of us are crucially important in supporting students through the post-secondary milieu. Um, so we'll take a look at that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper and look at the, uh, the, the uh, socioeconomic uh, situation of our students um, in terms of those coming, access and then success, and success in this, uh, success for Rose Chetty was predominantly in the labor market. It was the ultimate success in terms of their earnings. It's a bit harder to do that in South Africa. So we, we look at, we do come to labor market success right at the end, uh, as, and really uh, as, as the way forward, but success in this case is about graduation 
as we're going to talk about it today. And then some concluding comments about policy. Can you see? I hope so, because there's not much I can do about it if you can't. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. But luckily for you, I didn't produce the slides. Um, so, uh, uh, this, this is a, a slide that's about South Africa's inequality. So you all know, I think, that our measure of inequality is, is amongst the highest in the world, and we're always vying for the title of the most unequal country in the world. I don't know why you would vie for that title, but um, it's not a good thing to, to vie for. So this, this slide gives you some of the, um, gives a, a particular take on that. Uh, that focuses on the top 10% share of the country. So the top 10% of our, of our country, uh, the richest, in the, in the, that's what we mean by top, not the best or whatever, right? The richest, uh, what share of the income of our country do they actually have available to them to chart their lives, to put their kids in good schools, etc.? What share? And the chart shows Clearly, I don't think the cursor shows for you, does it? No. Uh, so there's no point in pointing the cursor. Um, but the chart shows that, uh, you know, starting way back, the, uh, uh, that share has always been, like, extremely high, close to 50%. And as a reflection of the fact that our inequality hasn't gone down at all, it, it was pretty flat through to the early 1990s, but over the post-apartheid years, it's actually been rising. That top 10% share has been rising quite sharply so that, so that come, come into uh, beyond 2010, that share is sitting above 60%. So 10% so of our people have 60% of the income to work with in their lives and to, to, to use on their, on their children, etc. I mean, isn't that astonishing? And it's not just a starting, but look at it relative to the rest of the world. Where does that sit rest, relative to the rest of the world? It's right up at the top. And that's, that's, a, that's a devastating point because there's a huge literature showing the, the consequences of inequality. The, co the consequences in terms of stifled development, it's not a productive situation for South Africa to have 10% of our population or 60% of the income to make their lives work. That's not how you build a flourishing society, is it? Uh, and that's the point. And when Piketty, uh, uh, Thomas Piketty gave the uh, Nelson Mandela Memorial Lecture in 2015, he was humble enough to say that faced with such inequality, he wasn't exactly sure that he was talking to the, the orthodox policy solutions around redistributive taxes, etc. He wasn't quite sure what to make of the situation, actually, uh, and what the instruments were to reform such an unequal society. And uh, I think Russ Chetty helps a lot, though. In his focus on social mobility, he says, okay, what, what you make of, how, how do you tackle this? Well, you tackle it by doing whatever you can in your own spaces to promote social mobility, to promote the uh, opportunities for the, the more disadvantaged members of our society to actually move ahead, to, to be able to use their ingenuity and their, uh, their, their buy-in to our society to build their own project. So, that, so um, in that sense, uh, uh, the, the focus on social mobility becomes absolutely crucial. And, and Piketty's point come home, comes home to bite us when we look at our social mobility in the country. This, uh, this graph which was built, uh, built out of the National Income Dynamic Study that Bill Moses was talking about, um, it, it, it charts uh, what, how likely children are to, to be in the same uh, earnings position as their parents. So that's called intergenerational mobility. You can learn a lot of uh, name dropping for whenever you need it in this slide. Um, right? So intergenerational mobility, it's, that's pretty self-descriptive uh, self, uh, as a term. Um, but then, because we're economists, we'd say intergenerational earnings elasticity. And that's 
that, that will get you more kudos if you can put that one on the table. What the, but that just means that if you look at the bottom axis, we, we've organized uh, the, the, uh, the parents, where in the earnings distribution are the parents? That's on the bottom, right? Are they right at the bottom? Uh, in other words, at the 5% level, they're in the bottom 5% of the earnings distribution. As you move to your right, uh, we move to those that are at the, at the top. Those are the parents. And then on the, on the other scale, the so-called intergenerational earnings elasticity really is, is, you can think about it as the probability of being in the same position as your parent. So the South African dream, and Chetty's uh, presentation was called Achieving the American Dream or something like that, right? The social mobility uh, concept is the key that we've all got a shot, right? And, the, and I think the South African dream is stronger than that. It's to build a society post-apartheid that's better than the one that, your, that the parents enjoy. Both sites for your children, right? So this is a crucial slide and it's devastating. I find it uh, completely devastating. Those at the bottom 5% uh, of the distribution, uh, their probability of being in, the kids have, the, have a 95% chance of being in the same at the bottom of the, of the current South African earnings distribution uh, if your parents were right at the bottom, you've got a 95% chance of being there too, as a child. That's what the 0.95 right up at the top on the left means. Now, when, when Chetty was talking about the grand debates in US society about social mobility, the debates were about the American dream where they're debating an intergenerational earnings elasticity between 0.3 and 0.6. So point three means the American dream is alive because you know you've only got a 30% chance of being in the same status as your as your parents. Point six, Americans think the American dream is dead in the water. So think about a point nine five as an achievement of the post South African society for the most disadvantaged South African. So although that that intergenerational elasticity declines and it declines. Uh, all the way to, to, you know, all the way through, really, um, for the most part. But it, it, it drops, note how far it drops. It drops to 0.6. Right? So, be, be clear, this is, uh, and so what does that mean? As you move up the distribution towards uh, parents who are in, in, say, the 50th percent, percentile of the earnings distribution, your children have got a 65% chance of being in the same place at the middle of the earnings distribution in South Africa. As you move on, you're moving from a situation of passing on disadvantage to passing on advantage. Because the lack of mobility at the top end means that you're passing on your advantage to your children. Right? There's nothing wrong with that, but if 10% if of people are earning 60% of the income, that's let's see what we can each do in our spaces. The rest of the presentation then moves to the post-secondary post schooling and shows you how important your task and your mission is, really. So here we have a, a, a slide that's just about the returns that you get from different levels of schooling in the South African labour market. So I'm linking it to the previous graph and just showing you what's happened. If you have a primary schooling uh, you can see what's happened to your, your, your earnings, your average um, return per year. That, what is a return per year? It's, it's your, um, your, uh, your, your, your earnings in the labour market relative to the other groups. You can think about it like that. Uh, and what can you see about the primary schooling, the returns to primary schooling? It goes only as far as 2011 in the slide. I'll talk about that just now. But primary schooling are declining, right? So if you, if you come out of school with only a primary schooling, your returns in the labour market, the labour market doesn't validate, it's increased, your, the validation in the labour market is going down. Similarly, and even, even more sharply, in a sense, in complete secondary, if you have a, a, a metric, um, the, the returns are increasing. So complete matric counts. You know, you hear people on the radio uh, insulting the youth of our country when, when the matric results come out and they say to people, well, it's not worth the paper that it's written on, right? 
how can you tell that to a young person who's fought so hard to get a matric? Uh, and, and that's not the actual reality. That doesn't mean there's not an unemployment issue, uh, but so that's the reason why they're aspiring to get a complete matric. But look especially then at the tertiary, strongly rising over the post apartheid years, right? So the, the, the returns that people get on, on accessing a tertiary qualification is, is extremely high. Um, the slide stops in 2011. Uh, this slide, I presented the slide at a Seattle Malala conference that we need some archaeology to work out where that was. It was a, it was a long, long time ago. Uh, and, um, it, but the trend has continued on. And we, we produce, we're just trying to make it a bit more concrete by producing some evidence uh, from the NIDS, NIDS data that we have. Um, so it's 2017 evidence that just tries to make my point a bit more concrete. So at the top, you've got the probability of employment. What's the probability of being employed if you've got a certain qualification? So you can see that if you've got less than a grade 12, you've got 73% chance of being employed. Uh, if you've got uh, a, um, I wish my eyes were a bit better, uh, but you've got a diploma, less than a, one of those diplomas where you don't have, that's below um, a complete matric, 74, grade 12, uh, 78, certificate or diploma with grade 12, uh, 85, sharp rise. Uh, NTC, NCT, uh, 87, and a degree, 93. So the probability of being employed if you've got a, a degree is 93%. And there's lots and lots of evidence that, that we, we don't want to allow the discussion about unemployment in South Africa to be too distracted by the myth of graduate unemployment. Uh, it's, we, we must aspire for this degree. Uh, but look at, at look what that means. So if you are employed, You've got a degree. You earn, uh, on average, 21,000 Rand per month. Okay? So that's what it trans that probability of employment translates into 21,000 Rand a month. You've got a lower probability of employment if you've got less than grade 12, but if you are employed, you earn 3,000 Rand a month. That's in 2017. The national minimum wage, which was set in 2018, it was 3,500 rand a month. That was the that was the national minimum wage. Okay, and so you can see. Look at that. Look at the jump in the gradient for those with a degree. But also the the, the much higher returns for those with a diploma, uh, etc. Crucial context for us, and it brings us then to. Uh, the actual qualifications, who, who are coming into the system, who are attaining these higher education qualifications, what's the history of that in, in South Africa from 1994. Uh, Jenny was uh, sketching earlier using some of Charles's work, um, the success for those, in a sense, for those who do get into the institutions. This slide helps us contextualize a little bit, well, what's our progress been in getting people into institutions. So we can see uh, at the, the top line is all, all post-school qualifications. Every, uh, the bottom line is, is diplomas, bachelor's degrees or higher. And it's not, it's not a great picture of progress. We're tracking quite, quite a long run here from 1994 to 2021 using labor market data, uh, well, using uh, labor market surveys, but they ask people about their qualifications. Um, and uh, so it's pretty flat. And then we, we, uh, we put a goal up there that we derived ourselves from the National Development Plan. It, there is no higher education goal in the National Development Plan specifically, that they've got goals about employment and they've got goals about poverty and inequality and uh, that goal of 28% of, of the population having uh, attained post-school qualifications 
is, is not out of line with the rest of the national development plan. So it's not out of line with what this country needs to do to achieve our goals. And you can see that we've fallen quite far short of that. That's what the slide is supposed to, to show us. As a share, Okay, and of course, uh, so that's not a number, right? That, that's not numbers of people. The, the, the numbers of people coming into universities has been increasing, as we know. But the shares haven't been uh, increasing. And particularly worthy of note is that the shares, uh, and I'll, I'll be quick on the slide, but the gap between African and white youth attainment has actually widened somewhat since 1994. So the shares of, uh, of white South Africans who attain a post-secondary uh, schooling is, is very high, extremely high. It was high anyway. It's grown. Uh, and uh, the, the African share has been pretty flat, as we've seen. So the, the consequence is that the gap has widened. Now, obviously, that's a crucial sort of um, benchmark for us to hold in our, our minds about our success in this enterprise of ours. Okay, so 25% in 1994 and 33% um, now. That needs to be interrogated, of course. That doesn't just speak for itself, but nonetheless, that's, that's a useful benchmark to hold. Important to note, though, for, for all of us who are sitting in the trenches and grinding away and really trying to, to achieve success in promoting social mobility uh, every single day, is that there's considerable variation across provinces in this, in this, uh, in, in the story. So the Free State Northwest was uh, sitting at the back there with some people from the Northwest, uh, not because of the slide, it just happened like that, um, uh, have achieved uh, the largest growth in uh, in the shares of uh, attainment of post-secondary qualifications. Tharting and the Western Cape are, are pulling even further ahead. They were they way higher, and they were, they're pulling further ahead. Um, then there's some other provinces that have fallen behind. Opo, KZN, yeah. So, so I don't think your work doesn't make a difference. Okay, if you're falling behind, it doesn't mean you're doing a bad job. That wasn't my point. Um, Okay, but let's dive a bit deeper into, uh, into the, the socioeconomic status and higher educational access and success. It's not so easy to link the type of data that uh, Jenny was talking about and that you work with every day uh, on, on student pro, uh, progress through universities to their socioeconomic status of where they come from. What families do they walk out of the door and Put up, pick up their bag and get on the train or the taxi and go to university. What does that household background look like? It's not so easy to do that. Uh, your, the hemostata gives us a lot of uh, information about within the system, but uh, the SES information has to come from somewhere else. And so some of the work that, uh, that Nicola and Emma and Vimal uh, have done in Sia Pambili has to has been to match student postal codes. All universities ask students, okay, what's your address, right, as part of the application process. So you've got data about where they come from. You just don't have anything in the university system about what that looks like. So what, do, what, what has been done here? Well, you match the, that data to the postal code. They, they, look some, they tell you where they look, and there's a postal code on their address. You match that to the postal code data uh, in the census. And then you, you can match back to the area that they, they walked out of the door from uh, to, into your post-school institution. We're restricted to using the 2011 census at the moment. As you all know, we were probably census last year, weren't you? There was a national census. It's due to be released in 2020 this year, later. Um, it's very important that we get an updated picture, but for now, the best picture we have is from the 2011 uh, census that can tell us what those postal codes look like. And you can, you have to make some assumptions. We've done a lot of careful work in, in Sia Pambili to look at these postal codes and there's a lot of variation within them, so you've got to be careful. But let's, 
it's not too much of a distortion to use the average income of that postal code as a reflection of the socioeconomic status of the postal code. So uh, in a lot of our, in our analysis going forward, we classify students from quintile one to three postal codes as lower income. We use the postal codes as a marker for lower income. Quintiles one to three, obviously quintiles divide the population up into 20%, 20%, 20%. 20%. So that's 60% of the population we're uh, categorizing them. And lots of our careful benchmarking, that's, they're definitely lower income. That's not the issue. Uh, so postal codes one, two, three, we're using that as a marker rather than say using MISPAS or, or something like that. So here's a map then that maps uh, these quintiles. Um, student SES using postal codes. So here's a map that tells you what that is. So quintile five, those are the best off uh, on average postal codes. So the st students who, who come out of those postal codes are come out of the best off environment. And then uh, quintile one are the worst off, at 20% of, of the population. Uh, the no data doesn't mean there's nothing going on there. Uh, it just means that, um, that there, was, uh, there, there was no student, uh, uh, students coming out of those areas. Okay, so if you, you, know, you, you, you get the picture and what do you see here? Well, there's been, been many of these maps. I've produced many of these maps in my general work on poverty and inequality in the country. And they always shout in your face that the, the historically disadvantaged parts of South Africa, the, the old Bantustans, for example, are, are quintile one here again, uh, etc. The, 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 the map shouts about the fact that, um, that we haven't done a great job of redressing any of our legacies and where that's consequential for us this morning is that that's the background within which the student was shaped before they marched into your tertiary institution. So just one, um, one implication, just to draw out one point. So focusing on the quintile five postal codes, 27% uh, of all students from quintile five postal codes are from postal codes called Joburg, Santon and Randburg. So we all know that Santon and Randburg are part of the Greater Johannesburg. The point is, the postal codes that are called Joburg, Santon and Randburg, 27% uh, of the national share of students who come out of quintile five backgrounds come out of those three postal codes. So this is incredibly consequential for our analysis. Uh, now this one you probably can't see. Well, I certainly can't see it, but I, know, I, I should know what's in it. Um, what we've got here is we've organized, uh, we've organized low income access. So we're focusing on quintiles one to three, right? That's what we mean by low income. And we're focusing on the access to tertiary institutions to post-secondary uh, institutions uh, by institution and that's that's what you can you can get now by taking that postal code information and splicing it in to the HEMAS data joining them together so you're now linking students and their backgrounds into your data so these are your students in your institutions and the backgrounds that they they come out of and, uh, and on the, on the left-hand side, we've, um, we've got the share of students who come out of quintile one to three in that institution. It's not a national share. So you can see right at the bottom, there's a 4% of students in the University of Stellenbosch that are coming out of quintiles one to three. Right? But that's just, okay. Uh, where is the graph? You know, the, the graph goes, goes up from there and you can see uh, right up at the top somebody can read it to me can you see it who's the top institution vendor right and what's the share right great you guys are sharp this morning um, okay the, the, what's the dotted line of point six it's very useful to you it's very useful to us Point six, remember the bottom three quintiles, that's 60% of the 
of uh, the students, right? So that bottom line just gives us, that dotted line at point six tells us about the institutions that are, that are ta taking more than 60% of uh, students from quintiles one to three. Uh, whereas those below are taking taking less, and the distance tells you something about how big that is. Um, okay, so in some institutions the share of students is low. There's many, many caveats about this, right? Many, many caveats, and it needs to be used by your individual institutions very, uh, as well as you can. Um, so in, in some institutions the share of students is low, but they represent a large number of students. This is not numbers, it's shares, and shares can sometimes uh, distort. So I'll give you an example. So 33% of University of Pretoria students come from lower income postal codes. So they're quite far below the, the, the 0.6, the 60%, right? 33% of UP students come from those postal codes. But that's 291, uh, 2,911 students. Right, which is similar to the University of Vendor, which has the highest share, which as you told me just now, has the highest share of students coming from uh, quintiles one to three backgrounds. So, uh, so that's why you need to be careful. We need to be careful with these numbers, but nonetheless, we do need to know who are taking South Africa's disadvantaged students, and, uh, and then we'll go on to see, okay, and so what's happening to them? Because that's the mobility, that's our role. We're now, we're now at the business end of this talk, in a sense. Because that's the, that's the front end that we're working on, because that's the social mobility that's going to transform our country. We've shown the importance of post-secondary schooling in transforming our country. Now we're showing, okay, who are the target people that are going to be the heart of that transformation? And they're walking into our institutions. And we need to know what that looks like, both as in the national landscape, but also in our individual uh, landscapes. So following Chetty now, we try, and, we try and link that then to some outcomes, to link the, the progress of these disadvantaged uh, students, these, these students from quintiles one to three, to some outcome. And the outcome that we choose is graduation, for now. Let's focus on graduation because it's a form of success. These disadvantaged students are coming into your facility. If you're going to promote social mobility in this country, they need to graduate out because that's where the returns come in the labor market, as we saw earlier. So, this, that's exactly what this graph does. You, you, on, uh, on the left-hand side, on the vertical axis, you've got the, the share of these students that are quintile 1 to 3, and on the bottom, you've got the uh, um, oh, sorry, on the, on the top right? right? You graduate in the, in the required years. Three-year degree, three years. Four-year degree, four years. That's what graduation on time means. So that we've got the shares graduating on time on the left-hand side. We've got the shares of the institutions, the, the, the students one to three shares at the bottom. Is that okay? You got it? Are you still with me? Yeah, okay, I need a bit of affirmation. <laughs> Thank you for the affirmation. Uh, I mean, this is a, this is a, 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 a very interesting graph, I think you would agree. Uh, what, for example, let's take the University of Cape Town, my own institution. So, um, that, as we saw earlier, they've got a, uh, a fair, pretty low share of students from quintiles one to three backgrounds walking into our institution. Um, and, uh, uh, but, and of that, of that share, like 20%, right? Of that share, 30% of that share graduate in three years, if it's a three-year degree, right? On time, according to the d uh, nomenclature, that's a bit of a word. Um, the, what, what does the positive upward slope mean? It's very interesting. That, that, that shows a general tendency that, you, that institutions that take the higher shares of quintile one to three students have a higher chance of graduating students in, on time. 
in that sense. That's very, that's very, very interesting, isn't it? Uh, and one can surmise. I'll leave it up to you. You're the experts about what's going on inside these institutions that might lead to an outcome like that. Uh, that's not uniformly true. You can see some institutions that aren't, uh, aren't doing so well, that are below the line. Uh, but you can see some institutions that are, to some extent, this is a, um, you know, one has, to be, one has to be cautious about the data. You can see the uh, University of Mpumalanga and the Salt Lake East University is right up at the top on the right. Those are the new institutions. They've, they've got quite a small student numbers. That doesn't mean we shouldn't celebrate that success that we're seeing right there. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, uh, making a point that you've got to be circumspect about your, your data. Uh, still, uh, this is not what Chetty shows in his graphs. He, he doesn't show that, but his graphs are about are mapping between disadvantaged students and outcomes in the labour market. So he doesn't have this intermediary step. I think that's a, a weakness with Chetty, right, so we can take some credit. But we long, we long for being able to link our students into the labour market, and I'll talk about that now. That's a little editorial. I want to do, this is a crucial slide, even if you can't see it. Hopefully you can take away the key, the key messages, because it goes to, very, to current policy debates and to your lived reality in terms of your dialogue with policy. So the, the graph on the left-hand side is just a reproduction of what we've just looked at. It's those graduating on time, okay? And the, so that story is, is the same as, it, as the previous graph. The one in the middle then is N plus one. Those graduating within one year extra of, what, of the on-time definition, right? I'm quite crazy about on-time, but you guys can't because that's your work, right? Uh, still, so N plus one. And what can you see? You can see, uh, I'll take my UCT again, because we used that example just now, like a, a much stronger gra graduation performance if you go N plus one rather than N. In fact, it's so strong that it begins to approach the norm. So obviously institutions that do a great job in graduating people in N, then you, if you go N plus one, they add some, but they started with quite a strong uh, performance to begin with. You got a university like Cape Town that didn't do particularly well in N, but the one year of difference makes an enormous uh, difference to stu students graduate out with one extra year. Okay, and so there's some sort of catch up to those other institutions. And if you do N plus two, the catch up is incredibly strong. Look, they're all clustered together. Okay, and they're all clustered together, and by the time you get to N plus two, the dominant story restricting further progress is dropouts. Because you can't graduate in N or N plus one or N plus two if you drop out. So to some extent, the fact that we're not at 100%, we're at 0.7 or 0.8, is a reflection of dropouts. And the universities that fall, that, that fall down the list over time, or were at the bottom, like UNISO didn't do well in the beginning, and it's, and it's not doing very well at the end. That's about dropouts, okay? But if you think about the national policy discussion, where there's a lot of pressure from DHET to think in terms of uh, graduating in, in, like no, no funding to universities for graduates uh, who do N plus two. We have been supporting institutions to get students through in N plus two. It's a very uh, visceral, important policy uh, concept. The, but that, that, that then means we spend a lot of money on students in the system. And so the view from the, from the planners and from the treasury and stuff is we can't afford that because we need to put resources in for those coming through. But what this is showing is that that's a very delicate balance in terms of, okay, if, we re, if you know, institutions are going to achieve their purpose, and students can do graduate out of these institutions. There's also a, a national disaster in not funding students uh, for this, for one plus one, plus two. If they were going to graduate, get on and be part of a social mobility story in the country. That's also a, 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 a waste of resources for the official, for the initial end. 
So you know more about this than me. Isn't that a crucial policy uh, issue right there? And it's about the mobility story because it might be. The students are coming from quintiles one to three. They come into your institutions with different background, with, with a particular background, and you work very hard with them to support them. We all know they've got the possibility to succeed with the right supportive infrastructure. Right? Sometimes that takes more than N. There's no rule that says you can automatically do the improvements required to graduate people out of your institution at the, uh, at the quality that your society needs in N. That's not entirely fair on the student and it's, it's certainly not that good for society. So I think this is a crucial slide. Don't, don't you agree? Where yeah. are you <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so Chetty defines success in terms of labor market outcomes. And we've, we've, we've been on this grand mission, even from when I spoke at the last uh, Sierra Malala conference. Remember dinosaurs and all of that? Um, the, uh, there has been some work that's, that's been done at the request of, of USAF and the request of, of DHET to actually use, uh, to link student data, HEMIS data, to, to tax data, to follow students out of the university administratively and into the institution, into the labor market. And because that's the only way, that's how Chetty does it, right? He's got this incredible database that can follow students from where they live, live, where their parents lived, through censuses, where, 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 where they all then moved, through censuses again, where they went to university, and where they, where they are in the labor market. And that's all, admin, that's all census data, administrative data about post-school uh, uh, education, and then the labor market story requires tax data. There's no other way. When, you, when employers file tax returns about their employees, you file personal income tax returns, and you can you can tell the story. So here's what we can see again by institution, and again the focus here by by um, by a, a team that was working uh, a team from HSRC actually, led by the Human Sciences Research Council. That, that was working on this. And again, they're focusing on these quintile one to three uh, students. 2015, same cohort as us. Oh, they're not quintile one to three, but they are the same cohort. Okay. Um, and the 2015 graduates, we are in the labor market in 2017. And, uh, and the, the focus then is, uh, is on the employer. How many of them are employed? What's the share of those graduates who are employed two years later? Right, between 2015 and 2017. And you can see uh, that the share is high. It's very high, I showed you that earlier. It's high on average. But this is by institution now. So students graduating out of these different institutions, CPUT, for example, uh, 91, 92% of their students are employed two years later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because the point of the success, the point of all of our hard work is not for us to feel good. That's our, it's, it's, it's what it does to the students. They're the people who are going to build this society and, and change, transform, etc., etc. So that's, that's, that's very dramatic. And you can see that the percentages are high across the institutions. These post-secondary school uh, qualifications are crucial to the social mobility project, to success in the labor market, which then allows you to build something different to what your parents had. Okay, wrapping up. I know I need to wrap up. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, a few quick slides. Um, JT makes this point about policy and about the social mobility project, and he locates 
the higher education enterprise in the broader social mobility. And it resonates with the presentation that we've engaged in this morning. Our focus has been on, the, on where our higher education fits into the social mobility project. That's right. But we've also seen that the background of students, and you know it yourselves from your daily work, the background of students really counts. What they bring into the university really counts. And so there's many, the, the, the policy approaches to upward mobility uh, involve a lot of pre-university or pre uh, post-secondary school institution policies about social protection and, and support and uh, nutrition and things that are, are basics for people thriving in school, ECD before school, as they go through the system. And then there's actual, the quality of schooling is a crucial thing that then brings people into our institutions and we pick them up at that point and then it's our responsibility to take it further. But what's happened before is crucial to that. And then of course we've just looked at the labour market. We, that's at the bottom of that slide, it's just not there. They, they exit out of our institutions and hopefully into a successful story. Okay, I won't talk about this slide. Uh, it's, it's, it's just work that we, we did for DHET that had a, 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 an inquiry into, um, into student fees and a sustainable system for student fees. What can we do, actually do in the country about student fees? And, and we, we did some work using the National Income Dynamics Study just to probe vulnerability and, and uh, what, is the, what is the background situation of students who are receiving NISFAS money, to what extent, because the, the, the NISFAS, the, the 350,000 uh, benchmark in, in NISFAS, it actually stretches quite high up the South African income distribution. So there's a lot that we need to know about the students who come from those households and whether they get, you know, whether those sorts of students are going to need NISFAS support forever. Uh, and how poor are they, etc., etc. So, um, so we did that work, and, and it shows what you would expect it to show that that the students who who are going to require this bus support in a in a dynamic sense is it's because of the households and the context that they come from, the education, their parents' education, uh, that whole legacy uh, re require leads them to to need free university education if this mobility project is going to actually succeed. But there's a lot more uh, nuance about the policy discussion in the so-called middle of the, of the student distribution and there's room for, for exploring other options in order to ensure that, that people coming in from the lowest three quintiles can get into our institutions and then we can do our work. Uh, and, and then they can go on and flourish. Okay, so uh, I actually, this slide is my all hands on deck slide. This is us, guys. Okay, we've, today we've discussed inclusive access, which happens before people come into your institutions. You, uh, but then what happens inside the institutions is your moment to have, a, have an impact on the mobility project on the graduate outcomes, they graduate out of your institutions and they go ahead and transform our country. It's our dream, right? Thank you. So we're running just a little bit late, but if there are any questions uh, for Professor Leibrand, uh, we could probably do one maybe more than one, but it has to be a question. It can't be a statement. Does anybody have a question for Professor Leibrand? Francois. Uh, firstly, Mike, thank you for a phenomenal presentation. Sorry for the Afrikaans outburst of here, here, <laughs> because um, I think what's for me so critical here is that balance that key slide. So from N1 to N plus 1 to N plus 2. It looks to me in your data that the numeracy and literacy work is critical. And we know there's a lot of conversation around 
foundational modules in, for our American colleagues to develop mental courses. Um, in your data, does it show the, the, were you able to see the importance of those courses for in uh, helping students uh, to stop earlier, maybe N plus one instead of N plus two? Is there any sort of data there? Why don't you take the mic to Nicola? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, that's really hard. I think Nicola should take a crack at that one. Uh, it's, it's a great question and it's a lot because it brings it back to what we're doing here. slides um, earlier, you, you, you spoke about the 10% um, who have a larger share of the economy. I just want to find out in real terms, why is the story is not so great um, in proportions, but in real terms has the income for the other 90% increased at all? Is there any story to tell about that? Mm. Well, then I can answer. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yes, there, there has been uh, some improvements in, in, uh, in absolute living standards, that's what you're asking about, right? Uh, but uh, it's, it's a mixed story because our poverty rates actually, they have come down somewhat, so that's a straight answer to your question, right? That's a reflection of certain people's income, but, but uh, they haven't come down that dramatically. We still live in a society where statistics South Africa tells us that 55% of the population live below the poverty line. And we haven't actually done a dramatically good job of changing that situation. So that it's not unimportant to note where there have been improvements, and many of those are driven by the social protection policies that I had on my last slide. Uh, rather than a sustainable labor market employing our, our, our learners out of, out of high, school, high school, out of uh, post-secondary school. Uh, with, yeah. So the income dynamics are driven mostly by uh, improvements in our support structures rather than the, the growing of a, a productive society. Um, the student's success with respect to that. Um, do you marry that data with the, the family policy around the kind of families that are kind of um, emerging in the South African population, single and uh, child-headed family, and how is that addressing, or rather pouring back into the tertiary institution? Because potentially, if we do say, maybe if I may to talk a bit in a, in a more gendered way, if, if, if the family, if, if, if uh, females are more empowered uh, in terms of their educational attainment. It, 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 it has a positive impact of our, uh, the children and all that, uh, based on the fact, or maybe supporting, or rather talking to um, uh, the kind of families we have in South Africa that I imagine. If it's single parent family, then if they are educated still, in spite of that being the family that is uh, amongst the type of families in South Africa, but it has the, the, posit the positive outpour mm. back into uh, the educational system of South Africa. But then, um, on a different point completely, I wanted to understand in terms of uh, the end classroom, if, if it has the positive impact in the long run on the country in, in terms of mobility and the development of the country, then how can we better, without actually compromising the, the, uh, uh, the quality of, 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 of the education in tertiary institution. How can we? Uh, I don't know whether we are proposing the Zimbabwe uh, double metric system in order for for the.
the student to not add more years or uh, we have to kind of vouch for more N plus rule, N plus two rule because it has that pouring back into the economy in terms of, yeah, the mobility. Thanks. Yeah, I think that, uh, rather, I'll address that last point in particular. I think it goes to, I think many of the delegates here uh, are involved in initiatives that, that reach back from your institutions into the schooling system, right? And I've met some of you uh, from the University of Pretoria, for example, um, and you, you, that's exactly the right margin that you're talking about, right? We, we can't, uh, the education system is, going, is trying to improve itself, but we can't, it, when we're picking up uh, these young South Africans, we, we can't wait for the education system to improve, right? But we do, and that was what Transvaal was pushing on a little bit, we do need to work on the margin that, that's, that empowers students to graduate in N plus one rather than N plus two. I think your phrasing was perfect on that front. And, the, and much of the, everything we're talking about at this conference is about that. Right? And that is the margin that we have to work on because I don't think that the systemic restructuring of the education system is going to help us in, in the medium run even in the country. So, the, great point. On the, on the gender point, uh, look, the only slide I had on gender was on the intergenerational mobility slide, right? And all that it showed was, uh, was the fact that um, that your father seems to bring better networks and better um, better access to their children than mothers do. So it's a reflection of patriarchy or something like that, right? It's, a, it's another reflection of the many things that stifle the, the mobility in this country. Yeah. Well, I want to thank uh, Murray. I, I think. I think uh, it, this is a really thoughtful series of questions for all of us and the work that we're all doing to improve student outcomes. So that for those institutions that we can move from N2 to N1 so that we're helping students to get that degree more quickly, they're getting out into the, to uh, uh, working and getting higher incomes, they're saving money for the state, they're opening spots for other students at the institution. These are all really worthwhile goals and this is everything all of you are doing, trying to figure out ways to get those students better prepared when they arrive and ensuring that they can study and succeed and flourish and do so in a reasonable amount of time. And so um, I think we, we know what the problems are and I think you are all coming up with the solutions. So thank you so much. Thank you to uh, Dr. Librand and uh, it was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>